Good day chaps. So today's video will cover some of the weapon tests carried out during the post-World War II. Previously we looked at the development of the uh, 20 pounder gun and the 32 pounder guns tested on some old Panthers as part of the weapons development. But today we're going to have a look at another test, the Tiger II versus 165mm Hesch round and see what happened and also cover briefly how Hesch works. So let's start with a quick overview of Hesch, as it's often a misunderstood round, but it's been around since the beginning of World War II, and isn't, as quoted by one museum, a post-war invention. Rather, throughout World War II, the concept became more refined. During the early war years, it was used on weapons such as the Blacker Bombard, a spigot mortar that used a high-explosive warhead for the role of anti-tank work, primarily with the Home Guard forces, and this was filled with Noble's Explosive 808, a plastic explosive to good effect, and it was more than capable of destroying any German tank that they had in 1941. Although, as a general principle, the explosive type was primarily used in anti-fortification work on wall breaking, hence they got named wall burster rounds. As the war progressed, other types of explosives were tested in varying levels and styles, especially those made by ICI, and used in weapons such as the AVRE mortars and the R. Diraghi. By July 1945, the concept was very much set. Tests had been carried out on things like this Stuart Mark III with a 95mm round filled with PE2 and it demonstrated that such rounds were effective versus armour, with this example being done to see if the new rounds would be useful out in the Pacific. At this time, the rounds were still called wall bursters. Moving on to 1948, when today's test took place, the rounds are now called squash head and used the PE3 filler or Plastic Explosive 3 and the full term HESH or High Explosive Squash Head was in use by the 1950s and then later HEP or HEP for High Explosive Plastic an Americanized term was also coined. So exactly how does HESH work? Well the principle is quite easy in theory but in practice there are a lot of things that can mitigate this. The basic layout of a round in most forms is in three parts. The nose or front will have a desensitizing material to soften the impact and this has been a variety of things over the years including tar and at least in one test peanut butter. Following this you have an explosive charge in the form of plastic explosive with the old gel ignite being replaced with PE2 and then PE3 and so on. And then finally to the rear you have a fuse designed to detonate a few milliseconds after impact. When fired, Hesch rounds are noticeably slower than conventional anti-tank rounds, often between 500 to 800 meters per second. If the velocity is too great, the Hesch round won't work as intended. Secondly, the case itself needs to be of sufficient thickness to prevent the round from splitting down the sides and thus disrupting the explosive shape. There's also a long-standing myth that Hesch requires rifled guns to work. This isn't actually that true, and it can work with smoothbores. However, Hesch would require to be fin stabilized to be fully effective in a smoothbore gun, with the argument being that you would thus need to make the round longer or use flip out fins affecting drag and crosswind performance, or accept a smaller charge, hence less effective. Either way, we'll cover that more in an in depth separate video. Upon striking the plate, the round squashes against the armour in what is sometimes called a pat, and the explosive filler forms a pancake of explosive in a flattened hemispherical shape, or this can change to oval or elliptical shape depending on the angle that the round strikes. A fraction of a second after the pat forms, the fuse detonates the explosive. Now if the pat is formed properly, then the shockwave from the explosive in contact with the armour will travel through the steel until either its energy is expended or it hits a vacuum. Now contrary to popular opinion, it's not the hitting of the vacuum that causes the scab, rather in the same way that ultrasonics work on metal. The wave propagates back to the rooted explosion through impulse loading, creating compression waves which upon hitting the void are reflected back as tension waves. When these two waves overlap one another, that's when the material's tensile strength is overmatched and the metal in between the areas of the overlapping waves is sheared off and propelled inside the vehicle. This shard of metal, usually called a scab, is travelling at velocities of up to 50% of the initial explosive velocity and will then ricochet around inside the tank's interior until its energy is spent, causing severe damage to anything squishy inside the tank, breaking open and damaging all but the hardest fittings. 
This is often accompanied by smaller fragments that break off from the outside of the scab, which radiate out in a shotgun type effect. This scab and fragment always varies depending on the size of the round striking, the armour type itself, and the thickness. That being said, Hesh is not a win all round. Its effects can be heavily mitigated by several factors. First of all, it's next to useless on modern composite armour types and spaced armour. If the air pocket is large enough to prevent the plates coming into contact, or there's a burster plate that is sufficiently thick, then the shockwave will have no ability to be transmitted to the inner layer. However, the blast outside can still cause some damage depending on its size. Secondly, the metal itself on the target plays an important part, whether it's cast metal, rolled homogeneous armour, or if there are any impurities or faults in the metal that can affect the blast. Again, as we'll see, two shots from similar angles can cause two very different sets of results. So with that said and done, let's take a look at the test done on our Tiger II in August 1947. With the aim to test the effectiveness of the new 6.5 inch Hesh rounds, which were to be fitted to the future Avery's, notably the Churchill, and at the time, the proposed FV201 version. Although Centurion would later be fitted with it, at that time no plans had been made, with just the Mark IV and the 95mm being considered. This Tiger was one of several brought back to the UK, it was an older version with a pre-production turret, and was used to test both landmines and these Hesh shots, with the reasoning being that its armour was at least comparable to whatever the Soviets might be chucking out, and that the steel quality in these particular Tiger tanks was pretty good early on unlike the large stock of Panthers that we had, which had terrible quality steel and would give therefore poor results. Sadly, however, they did not record which number this Tiger II was, with just 3529 as the number recorded anywhere. The Tiger II was marked down as a nun runner, with its final driving gearbox missing, although the engine was intact. 38 inert 88mm rounds were added to the usual spots, as well as having a bow machine gun fitted. In each seat, a straw-filled sack dummy was placed to observe any potential damage to the crew, and a mock-up transmission was added, while on the right turret cheek, track links were added to use to test any effects they might have on these Hesh rounds. The rounds themselves were fired from a 6.5-inch gun mounted on a regular 6-inch gun mount at about 50-foot distance from the tank. The first round struck the upper glassy plate some 26 inches above the centre line. Now this caused uh, an 18 by 14 inch wide dent, roughly 1 inch deep, on the outside, and the external damage pitted the gun heavily, broke the weld seams on the upper deck and glassy seam, and dislodged the driver's plates. The driver's scopes were damaged, and the upper deck plates had fractures, while the hull machine gun fixture had a 28 inch crack, and the lower weld between the glassy and nose plate was also broken. Internally, this story was a lot worse. The round had scabbed a 15 by 13 inch piece of metal, 1.5 inches deep, weighing 61 pounds, or 27.6 kilos. This scab went through the steel mock-up final drive, which would have rendered any vehicle immobile. Fragments damaged the bow machine gun, but not the gunner, and the driver would have lost an arm and a leg. However, the turret crew were untouched by the round. This strike, although not fatal, would have rendered the tank immobile, and the hull would have required a complete factory rebuild to fix it. The second round struck at 30 degrees off centre to the Tiger's gun, to represent the vehicle trying to angle its armour. The front was dented again, 18 by 17 inches and 1 inch deep. The welds between the upper and lower nose were severed, and cracks formed up on the glassy side. To the left of the tank, the upper hull and pannier sides also developed a long crack, while the lower nose and hull floor developed a 17 inch fracture. Internally, the story was similar. A 15 by 13 by 1.5 inch scab, weighing 74 pounds formed, and shot into the Ford steel mock-up transmission again, utterly destroying it. Internal cracks and distortions were present, and daylight could be seen through the cracks. However, the witness plates indicate that apart from a mobility kill, the crew would have survived this shot. Next up was the turret. Shot 3 was aimed at the turret's left side cheek, but went a little higher than was planned. The round left a 12 by 9 inch dent and broke the joint, separating the parts quite visibly, while the welds down to the turret ring were cracked. The top of the turret had two distinct cracks in the steel, but both hatches remained operational. Inside an 8 by 7.5 inch scab was found, 6 foot away. 
while the witness plates inside were peppered with light spool. The scab had broken off, destroying the machine gun, and the tank's breech and the turret race bolts. The straw dummies were then inspected. All crew would have been killed, with a loader's dummy having holes through its stomach, head and legs, the gunner with two holes in the head, and the commander with punctures through the head and shoulder. This would have been a total kill if struck in combat. Round 4 was fired on the right hand side turret cheek. The armour here didn't scab as the round was not a clean hit being about 60% on target and the armour held. However it still bulged in and the resulting dent jammed the turret and prevented the gun from being usable. Cracks formed along the weld lines however the crew were registered as not injured. Now round 5 was tested on the side fitted with the track links and these were actually quite effective at preventing damage to the tank. The air pocket between the links and the armour dispersing much of the energy. Large cracks were found along the usual weld lines, however these were also discounted as likely to have been weakened by the previous strikes. The team noted down that the track links were quite an effective solution. Round 6 was the heaviest blow the vehicle suffered, striking the left side of the turret at 30 degrees offset, the armour here being around 80mm thick, and it completely caved in leaving a 20 by 16 inch hole into the vehicle. The impact also dislodged the 13 odd ton turret lifting it off its race in the opposite direction and the inside story was far worse for our straw crew. A scab 35 by 19 inches weighing 241 pounds or 109 kilos smashed inside the tank. The loader dummy was absolutely vaporized into loose horse feed while the scab struck the gun breech breaking it open. The gun shield itself was found wedged into the turret floor on the opposite side of the vehicle. Both other crew were found to be in a bad state from a mixture of particle strikes and the turret being shunted and would have been killed outright. The ammunition store was dislodged and ricocheted around the tank but miraculously none of it was actually perforated but deemed unusable afterwards. Next up was the skirting plate along the left side. The plates themselves blew off when it was struck and one of these plates was actually recovered over 100 yards away which might have caused some squeaky bum time for the testing crew who were actually only situated 50 yards away when they were firing. The pannier sides were split along the welding lines and although like the track links done previously the majority of the explosion was contained by the spaced armour. The ammunition was still badly dented although not destroyed and the wireless operator was killed and the replacement loader's legs would have been shorn off. Two track links were ripped apart, two more damaged and some minor damage to the wheels observed. Round 8 was used to see how well it could immobilise the target. The mudguard on the right hand side was struck, removing it and the main drive sprocket was severely damaged and bent back, torn from its housing while the tracks of the front were destroyed. This was deemed as irreparable without a factory overhaul due to the large fractures and dislodged metal, however no damage was done to the crew or the internal aspects of the tank. And we'll also cover round 10 here as well just because they used it on the wheels. These survived fairly well with the tracks breaking, the two wheels and immobilising it, otherwise the vehicle's insides were intact. Now round 9 was the sneaky shot in the back tactic, with the rear turret door chosen as the target. The door itself was blown inwards into three pieces and found scattered over the turret floor, while the securing bolts and fixtures were located in the front right of the turret. All crew were perforated by debris and considered to be killed outright, which was probably lucky as the testing team were running out of straw men at this point. The turret itself was lifted back out of its slot and moved two inches forwards. Five of the rounds inside the turret were found to be perforating and these were considered to cause an ammo rack had it been live. The last shot of interest was on the rear right side. This was against the engine and the round perforated the side plate leaving a clean hole 10 by 5 inches, scabbing a 24 by 6 inch hole in the side pannier. This immediately set the engine alight which developed into unfortunately an uncontrollable blaze gutting the tank. The engine is badly damaged and the internal fittings are buckled and caved in. After this the vehicle was unfortunately useless. The steel once it had cooked off would not be usable for future tests or data and nothing more was known of the vehicle. The overall conclusions were that the Hesh rounds could cause severe injury to the crew. However external track links were effective counters, side skirts provided average protection and that shots to the tracks and running gear would usually immobilise the vehicle while shots to an engine section would likely cause fires. Well guys, that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed this vid. Please do give it a like and a subscribe. 
we got slapped kind of silly by the YouTube algorithm when this PC went down with no videos for two months. So you're helping giving it a thumbs up, a share, or, I don't know, sacrifice a pig or something to the YouTube demons will help us a lot. And until next time, toodle pip.